It's one of the most famous battles of ancient history. Outnumbered Greeks stand firm in 490 BCE against the forces of the powerful Persian Empire. The freedom-loving Athenians left nearly alone to defend the Hellenic world, and perhaps therein our own. Nothing less than Western civilization and democracy were on the line. Let's discuss the Battle of Marathon, 490 BC. <laughs> for those who have watched this channel for a while, you are probably a bit confused. I've never really been one to do basic boy military history. Sure, I've done things here and there. Did a mini doc on a siege during the Spanish Civil War on location in Madrid. But in general, military history is way oversaturated at your local bookstore and history podcasts and on YouTube. So much so that people sometimes seem unable to distinguish history from its subset military history. What is history if not listening to overdramatic quotes from generals and kings or looking at an animated battle map like you're playing Rome Total War? War. I often see people comment on military history content that they miss when the History Channel had stuff like this and wasn't just Pawn Stars style reality TV. And I gotta break it to them, I'm not totally sure that looking at little toy soldiers moving around a battle map is more substantive than getting historical trivia from pawn objects. But, but whatever, here we are in a video about the Battle of Marathon. So am I a, a hypocrite? Yeah. Yeah, I am. This was originally envisioned as part of my video on Herodotus, investigating the early craft of history and the so-called first historian. We would have used a critical lens to see Herodotus and his histories in their proper context, and then, because we'd done that hard work, we'd treat ourselves to a bit of fun, analyzing Herodotus's telling of the Battle of Marathon. Let's have that sugary dessert just after our savory vegetable-laden educational dinner. A little indulgence in military history. Sure, it's nearly empty calories, vacuous, but we earned it. Well, it didn't work out that way. The healthy dinner was served months ago. My Herodotus video is up, and good news, you can still watch it. But for now, you get to skip straight to dessert. Good for you. Just remember it in its proper context. This is a treat. A balanced information diet of history content should not, in my opinion, focus on battle and big men, even if it's well-researched. It's still just well-prepared dessert. Preamble over. Let's rock. When discussing the Persian War, it can be easy to slip into melodrama, even chauvinism, the evil empire versus the democracy, and the Spartans. But we can also go too far, reducing it down to a map with little troop movements we actually can't really be too sure about. So together, let's try to thread the needle here. Of course, we're gonna talk about the battle, the armies, the personalities, all the caveats, and we're gonna acknowledge that this was indeed a moment, not of melodrama, but of legitimate drama. Greek independence, that is the independence of the many city-states of modern-day Greece was on the line. An empire with a well-informed distant king did try to subjugate them. He did send along their exiled tyrant to help. The Athenians were the underdogs, outnumbered by a huge amount, lacking in intelligence about the enemy, while the enemy had ample intelligence about them. Potential allies lost in what is today modern-day Western Turkey, Eritrea a city-state very close to Athens, fell, gone, like a domino. The Spartans were observing a religious holiday and unable to send any of those crack troops we're always hearing about. Spies tried to betray the Athenians. The Persians brought elite soldiers and elite intimidating cavalry. The Persian king had instructed his army to burn any resisting city to the ground. A gambler might put his money on the Athenians, but only because of the massive payout from their awful odds. The fact that out of the ashes of the Persian War comes the Athenian Empire, the Athenian Golden Age of artistry, philosophy, that the Romans would emulate this period, use this language, that the West could look to these two civilizations, that's all wrapped up in here too. The historian Herodotus is the source on the Persian Wars, a one-stop shop. I can list what else we have in a paragraph. Contemporary sources, inscriptions from the Persian king Darius on a mountain face that mention the Ionians as part of the empire, but not the Persian War. You still useful for contextual info on the Persians. Number two, a Greek veteran's dramatization of his participation in a battle through a play he wrote. Number three, for the Battle of Marathon specifically, archeological stuff, burial mound, excavated arrowheads, non-contemporary sources. Number one, Plutarch, with whom we spent a lot of time in the history mystery about Julius Caesar. He's writing much later, which calls his account into question. At the same time, he references works that have been lost to time, thus necessitating we at least give him a glance. And so for the Battle of Marathon and the Persian Wars more broadly, we're left mostly with the account of Herodotus. But there's more to Herodotus than the fact 
fact that he stands alone on the subject of the Persian Wars, Herodotus created a discipline. His work is known to many as the first history, maybe better phrased the first modern history, and he's known to this day as the father of history. Because Herodotus was hearing from Greeks about their own recent history, in part in order to explain that history back to them, we must consider the potential feedback loop. Kind of like a tale from a crazy party, a late night. Some crazy things happen, sure, but everyone involved is invested in making sure anyone hearing about it knows how unique it really was. This probably isn't the right simile for explaining a war, but it's the first to pop in my mind, and my imaginary producer didn't have any better ideas. Like I said, I got a full video out on Herodotus if you'd like to click through on the description and learn more. Okay, now that I made the disclaimer, let's set the scene and talk about the first Greeks to go against the Persian Empire and Darius, the Ionians. Ionia was an area of what is today modern-day Western Turkey. In this period, it was a place of independent and distinct city-states just like the rest of the Greek world around the Aegean Sea. Ionians were known as the Ioana by the Persians, and Cyrus I, or the Great, first conquered Ionia in roughly 550 BC. These were the first Greeks to encounter the Persians as they share this landmass. With these areas east of the Aegean conquered for Persia and exploration into mainland Europe underway, logic would dictate that the area west of the Aegean, a aka Eritrea, Athens, Sparta, were a leisurely sail away, and could be next integrated into the empire. And let me take off my serious hat here and put on my personal opinion hat. This seems like enough to understand why the Persian King Darius eventually invaded Eritrea, Athens, Sparta. Empires expand. Thus the Persian Wars. Thus the Battle of Marathon. However, Herodotus wanted to give us more. In book five of his histories, he gave us a more complicated explanation. He explained the pretext for the animosity from Darius against Athens, and it starts with the Ionians. The Ionians revolted for six years, roughly 499 to 493, and the revolt only ended after severe destruction. And the Athenians? Well, according to Herodotus, they were roped into helping the Ionians with their revolt. The Spartans had turned down the privilege of intervening, but the Athenians did not, sending something like 20 ships. If that number sounds like a small number of ships, it kind of is, almost like they're pitching in for a group bar tab that's a couple bucks short. And so Darius put down the Ionian revolt for good by sacking Miletus in 494. BCE. Once the revolt was put down, the stabilization and rebuilding of Ionia had to begin in earnest. Democracy was allowed in limited circumstances among the individual Ionian city-states to promote pacification. It seems a little counterintuitive to give rebellious entities leniency after six years of war, but I suppose they had the stick phase and so it was time for the carrot phase. But one group that Darius was not prepared to be soft with were those interventionist meddling Athenians and their 20 ships. <laughs> Herodotus wrote this wild anecdote for us. Upon hearing that the Athenians had helped out the Ionians with 20 ships, Darius was like, Athene who? Athenians, sir. Hmm. Athenians. And so, according to legend, Darius shot a bow straight up in the air and prayed to Zeus to help him punish the Athenians. Then he had his memory jogged three times at every dinner by a servant. Sir, remember the Athenians. Remember, this Herodotus wrote is why King Darius sent the mighty Persian Empire to sack Athens. Did Darius really want to teach Athens a lesson? Did he want specifically to end their independence, their fledgling democracy? I mean, okay, maybe it's not an apocryphal tale, but maybe, and you'll notice that my opinion hat still adorns my head, Maybe empires tend to expand, and that's the far simpler explanation. But the Athenians were in a bit of luck. Because the Ionians had revolted and put up a real fight, they succeeded in forcing Darius to expend resources putting them down. This in turn delayed Darius's invasion of Eritrea, Athens, and Sparta. The Ionians began their revolt around 499, and it was put down by 494, 493. The Battle of Marathon took place in 490 BCE. So the revolt fought the Athenians and all the neighboring city-states about a decade to buckle up, get some arms, some allies, hit the gym, lawyer up, and block Darius on Facebook. My imaginary producer is telling me that that joke is very outdated. Herodotus says that the Persians spent a year building a massive new navy just for the purpose of invading Greece. He puts the number around 600 new ships. This army and navy were sent in 492 BCE to hold the most western edges of Turkey, to tower over the Aegean Sea as a warning to the other Hellenes that the clock was ticking. Ionia is down, we've licked our wounds, and we're on the way. As if towering from afar wasn't enough, if the anecdote is true, Darius sent not diplomats, 
but heralds traveling through these Greek city-states to test the mood of people and power. Would they surrender or would they resist? Quote, he sent out heralds in all directions throughout Hellas and ordered them to ask for earth and water for their king. Some gave their welcome and their courtesies to the Persian visitors. But Herodotus wrote in Book 7 that when the heralds arrived in Athens, the Athenians, under a guy named Miltiades, we'll visit him again later, not only didn't take in the Persians, they took them over to a pit and threw them in. The Spartans, in similar fashion, threw the Persian heralds down a well. Quote, there your earth and water can be found. They supposedly said. <laughs> Again, these anecdotes are grains of salt worthy, but to not eschew all dramatic raising of the stakes, after the put down of the Ionians and the arrival of exploratory portions of King Darius's new army in Western Macedonia, everyone must have been on edge to see what would happen next. The Persians did not wait. They made their play for Athens. They landed at Marathon. Knowing the dangers of meeting the Persians in the field, but also the dangers of fortifying and hunkering down, the Athenian hoplites, those that could afford to arm themselves, decided not to simply wait, but to go to the exact spot the Persians were landing. The exact spot the Persians had chosen as favorable for their cause of sacking Athens. They arrived in time, blocking the two roads to Athens, and set up their positions, awaiting the incursion of the antagonists alone. Herodotus says that Miltiades and his force of 10,000 rushed to meet the Persians. Persian landing force. At the same time, a runner was sent to Sparta with news of the imminent invasion. The Athenians camped on a bit of high ground with room to retreat into even higher ground. There they waited. The initiative, for the moment, was with the invaders. The Athenians could only hope the runner they sent would arrive with backup from Sparta. But they knew Spartans would arrive at best within days. This runner, Philippides, apparently ran from Athens with news of invasion and arrived in Sparta by the end of the next day. After his arrival, the Spartans informed the runner Philippides that yes, assistance against the invaders? No problem. On the way. Just give us six days so we can obey our religious law and march to war at the full moon. That's right, just six days with the invaders already on the shore. The Spartans were probably honoring Apollo, though this may have been an excuse because they were fighting another city-state or putting down a rebellion. In any event, Sparta was in absolutely no rush. If the Spartans were going to wait six days to depart and then needed additional days to march from Sparta to Marathon, it was exceedingly unlikely that the status quo at Marathon would hold that long. The Persians were there to invade, not to dawdle. After the terrible news from Sparta, a bit of good news arrived in the form of a thousand reinforcements arriving from Plataea, an allied city-state. But even with a little extra help with the Persians on the shores, the Athenians were in a tough spot. Miltiades delayed and demurred to buy time for the Spartans to arrive, but it became clear that battle without them was going to be inevitable. The Persians were probably aware of the reason for delay and weren't going to wait for the Spartans to come and make their job more difficult. With the Athenians in a favorable position and the ticking clock aspect of potential Spartan reinforcements at some point, pressure was on the Persians to make the first move. But instead of waiting for that Persian attack, Herodotus claimed that Miltiades took the initiative. He pushed for the Athenians to attack first. From Herodotus, we get this colorful anecdote of the ten generals voting in a tie, five to five, for and against an offensive. For a tiebreaker, Miltiades apparently appealed to the Athenian polemarch Kalamakos with an impassioned speech. Quote, if this city prevails, it can become the first among all Greek cities. The authority to decide this matter has come to rest with you. After this, Kalimakos gave his vote for attack. Miltiades put that very same Kalimakos in charge of leading the right wing. The Plataeans were put on the far left. Overall, we're told Miltiades strengthened the wings while weakening the center. Quote, the Athenian army was equal in length to that of the Persians, but the center of the Athenian line was only a few rows deep, and thus the army was at its weakest point there. Herodotus went on, quote, when the Athenians were let loose, they charged at a run towards the barbarians. Miltiades had ordered this lengthy charge right at the invaders, a distance he claims of about a mile. The Persians could see that the charging Athenian numbers were thin and that they weren't accompanied by traditional support like cavalry or archers. And so Herodotus tries to put us in the mind of the other side, which he says thought the Hellenes were, quote, seized by utterly self-destructive madness. So Herodotus wrote that the Athenians took the initiative and charged. I should point out that it's also possible the Persians started to move up for an attack and the Athenians then decided to submit to the pressure and just charge. Herodotus says this battle went for a long time. As you might expect, when the two armies met, the thin center 
center of the Athenian line buckled back and the Persian forces pursued. As we already know, the Athenians intentionally thinned out this area. The Persians, by contrast, had focused their best soldiers here, both some core Persians and some Saka fighters incorporated into the empire from the steppe. At the same time, the Athenian wings staved off their opposition, but did not advance as the enemy drew back. Instead, the wings swung in towards the center, perhaps overlapping a tad with their retreating allies and flanking the pursuing Persians that had been more effective in pushing back the Athenian center. And thus, many fell. Kalimakos, the very guy we talked about earlier who voted for battle, died, so it goes. Herodotus says the Athenians succeeded big time once the wings flapped inwards, pushing back the Persians who retreated towards their ships. The battle didn't end with the retreat. The Athenians seized the opportunity to fight on the shore, interfering with the invaders' attempts to reboard their ships and leave, killing even more of them. The shore portion of the battle must have been close quarter and brutal as the Persians retreated back to the sea. Indeed, Herodotus zooms in for a second to tell us about an Athenian who tried tried to commandeer a ship until his hand was lost to the fall of a Persian axe. The Athenians were nonetheless able to take advantage of the general momentum to seize triremes, or failing that to set them ablaze. Let's talk numbers. As the Persian forces retreat, Herodotus claims the defenders stole seven ships. In addition, he says the invaders lost 6,400 soldiers, the defenders only 192. What are we to make of these highly specific numbers? Plutarch wrote the Persians numbered 300,000, but as we established earlier, he was writing centuries later. And Herodotus only gives us the count of the fallen, not the total army counts at the start. The reality is that there's not really conclusive evidence about the total number of Persians fielded at Marathon. I saw 25,000 several times in the writing of this video, cited earlier, but that's the bottom of a wide range of possibilities. After a resounding defeat at Marathon, the Persian forces supposedly tried to grab victory from the hands of defeat. If the bulk of the Athenian forces are here, they wouldn't be in Athens, so let's sail there and take it while no one's home. But the Persians didn't seem to think it through. Instead of going straight to Athens, they detoured to Sunion, then to Athens, wasting time. The result was that the Athenians, realizing the Persians' intent, packed up immediately at Marathon and marched home to Athens. When the Persian ships arrived from the detour, the Athenians had already made the journey on foot as fast as they could. The cause was lost. The armies of Darius would not subjugate this part of the Greek world. Herodotus finished his account of Marathon with an anecdote that exemplifies the wonder and the challenge of his histories. He told the story of a man who was blinded in the battle and remained so his entire life. Here's the catch. This guy, Epizelus, claimed he wasn't shot by an arrow, set on fire or anything. Instead, Epizelus claims a phantom passed by him, sparing his life while taking the life of one of his enemies. I suppose we are to believe this is some sort of an exchange, your life for your eyes. What we really have here is yet another reason this telling from Herodotus was so special. This story of Epizelus is not about a king or a general or a great man or a deity. It is, as best as I can tell, the exaggerated account of a war veteran. Here in a text from 2,500 years ago is the lived experience of someone without much power. That's why we read Herodotus. Given that these hoplites were the ones who could afford to be there, one would expect them to have each been transported back to Athens for proper burial and ceremony. Instead, we're told the fallen soldiers of Marathon were given the honor of being cremated and buried on the battlefield itself, and notably a mound on the earth you can still visit today. But the result of the Athenian victory at Marathon wasn't only a boost in Greek pride. The severe losses at Marathon caused Darius's army to abandon the invasion of Greece. Though the Persian king had every intention of returning and trying again, even spending three years accumulating an even larger army for the job, it wouldn't work out. With the different results and failing health, Darius was distracted. He died in 486 BCE. Through one battle, Marathon, the Athenians had bought the Greeks years of Persian free life. But of course, the struggle of the Greeks and the Persians didn't end with Marathon and the death of Darius. The notorious Xerxes, Darius's successor, would mount an even larger effort. The next invasion of Greece kicked off around 480 BCE. So if you're doing the math, one battle, Marathon, delayed further Persian invasion of Greece by like 10 years, a decade. Not bad. If you'd like full historical context on Herodotus, our main source on the battle, check out my video about him. And if you're still on the sugar high from this basic boy military history and you wanna pitch in for a little bit more substantive uh, vegetable kind of content, check out my Patreon. Later y'all.